just to make sure you are all in the correct place, this would be the panel called Searching for God in the Postmodern World, Fiction, Poetry, and Television. We're all here for that? Okay, good. Awesome. So I will briefly introduce uh, each of our speakers um, in the order that they appear in the program uh, and in the order in which they'll speak. So first, um, let me just introduce and welcome Julianne Dolan Mitchell. She's a doctoral candidate in systematic theology and a presidential fellow at the University of Notre Dame. Her research focuses on philosophical theology and the intersection of theology and the arts. Her dissertation seeks to construct a theology of human creativity, building on the philosophy of Jacques Maritain. Prior to joining the, pro the doctoral program at Notre Dame, she was a speechwriter in Washington, Washington DC. Please welcome Julianne. Any attempt to comprehensively capture what is meant by the Catholic imagination in an abstract or philosophical register will quickly be overwhelmed by the complexity of the rich array of artistic productions that have arisen in conversation with Catholic tradition, as well as by the arrival of fresh new aesthetic contributions that continue to reshape and revise the Catholic imagination as we understand it. As one organizer for this conference has said, while there are scores of styles to encounter and behold, the Catholic imagination is most penetrating and fruitful when organized around key attributes and qualities, some cultural, some critical, and others theological. This paper ventures a reflection on the significance of one such attribute, name, namely hopefulness, and its relevance to the Catholic imagination. I begin with a general reflection on the relationship between art and human longing drawing upon Friedrich Schlegel's exaltation of romantic poetry as the source of an experience of the infinite. I then pivot to the question, what is the difference between the kind of longing for the infinite we discover as a central theme of romanticism and eschatological hope? I offer in response to that, I offer in response that longing within the environment of Catholic faith is always oriented toward the eschatological promise of divine union. In other words, the Catholic version of longing is always saturated with hope. Taking these theological premises as a starting point, I visit the question of the Catholic imagination in its creative dimension and ask what difference this hopeful longing makes for the bearer of the Catholic imagination, the Catholic artist. I pursue one line of response to this question, which focuses on the way in which hopefulness transforms the Catholic perspective on ends or limits within the work of art. I argue that the eschatological dimension of the Catholic imagination both relativizes and elevates the significance of the human. That, as a result, Catholic art often reveals a complex relation to its own end. In the final section of the paper, I offer the concrete example of Evelyn Waugh's Brideshead Revisited as an instance of the Catholic imagination that transforms the significance of the let me begin by proffering a provisional definition of longing. Longing is a disposition of the soul toward wholeness, completeness, beauty, and perfection. Longing is a kind of desire, but is too fundamental to the person to be one desire among many. Rather, it is an existentially orienting desire, a desire that encompasses other desires. At the same time, longing implies a deficiency or lack. To long is to be disposed toward wholeness and to mourn its absence all at once. It is to live in a state of either deprivation or deferral. To all of this, we might add that longing connotes a duration. One does not long for that which can be immediately attained. One longs for what one perceives is still far off and distant. One longs toward eternity, toward fullness, toward the end. Though an association between human longing and the arts has roots as early as the ancient world, a proximate source of reflection on longing in the arts is found in the early German romantics. Friedrich Schlegel's famous exaltation of romantic poetry in the Athenaeum fragments describes a progressive universal poetry, the destiny of which is the unification of all genres, the fusion of poetry and po prose, genius and criticism, art poetry and nature poetry, the embrace of everything that is purely poetic. Romantic poetry alone is able to become a mirror of the entire surrounding world, 
an image of their age in the same manner as an epic to glide between the portrayer and what is portrayed free from all real and ideal interests. Romantic poetry has a capacity for the highest and most comprehensive refinement, not merely from the inside out, but also from the outside in. In its eternal becoming, romantic poetry extends into the infinite. This way, the romantic poet performs an act and enables an experience through poetry that corresponds to a human longing. Of crucial importance to Schlegel is the unfinished character of poetry. Its principal feature is an inherent resistance to completion. It remains always in the process of becoming, and in this state of eternal becoming, it is vast, inexhaustible, it is infinite, and therefore it is free. Schlegel takes longing to be paradigmatic of the human condition, for longing expresses the fundamental incompleteness of our relation to all that exists, including ourselves. He, and Romanticism more generally, came to this emphasis on longing in reaction to the excesses of light Enlightenment philosophy, which fixated upon dividing that which can be known from that which cannot. Poetry, the German Romantics held, one can transcend the binaries of the phenomenal and the noetic, of the world we can know and the world we cannot know. The strict dialectic that separates what is rationally accessible from what is rationally inaccessible yields to the possibility of a higher truth, one that pursues accessibility not by means of rational deduction, but by means of recognition of that which cannot be rationally grasped and acceptance of the finitude of rationality. What remains in the wake of such acceptance is human longing understood as a profound existential desire for the reconciliation of polarities, possibility of wholeness and beauty, even in, their, even in the face of their perpetual deferral. I lift up this example of romanticism not only to indicate its significant influence on contemporary views of art, but because it provides an illuminating contrast to the Catholic view of longing much in the romantic view of art and longing recommends itself for comparison with the Catholic imagination. For another, for one thing, longing is absolutely central to both the romantic imagination and the Catholic imagination. For another, there is a confidence in the ability of art to address itself to some sort of horizon of meaning. However, while both may be directed toward wholeness, fulfillment, or beauty, the Catholic imagination cannot conceive of such wholeness apart from the human divine relationship. Romantic poetry, at least the view espoused by Schlegel, by contrast, adumbrates an infinite presence through longing, but remains agnostic with respect to what satisfaction of that longing might mean. Longing itself is the con conduit of infinitude, but infinitude does not make itself known or grasped. Infinitude does not love or beckon. Romantic poetry brings us to consciousness of longing and thereby adumbrates infinitude precisely through that longing. But romanticism can only bring us to the infinite as we encounter it in our longing. It can make no promise of satisfaction, resolution, or beauty beyond that. The possibility of transcendence does not rest for Schlegel in the satisfaction of longing, but rather in the longing itself. Romantic poetry offers this experience of living toward the infinite through longing, through its eternal becoming. But it is an eternal becoming that also suggests eternal, eternal deferral. I've put forward the romantic view of longing as a relief against which we might consider longing within the Catholic imagination. If the posture of longing suggested by romanticism is that of the subject reaching outward toward the infinite that perpetually eludes him, the version suggested by Catholic longing is that of being held by the divine in relationship, a relationship that perpetually invites a deeper knowledge and intimacy of the beloved through the cultivation of longing. The point I would like to make is elementary. Longing in a Catholic context cannot be considered apart from the human divine relationship that elicits it. Moreover, I think we can take the claim a step further by suggesting that within the imaginative environment of faith, all longing is drenched in hope. A longing is hope. Through a complete defense, though a complete defense of the position would require a detailed study of doctrine and perhaps a theological survey of the topic of longing, here I offer only a brief reference to the theologian of longing par excellence, St. Augustine, who famously wrote, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. 
Augustine's pursuit of an elusive God, famously narrated in his Confessions, is equally a pursuit of human longing, a quest to touch and name the elusive energies, the grace, that compel the soul toward the divine. Even as Augustine recounts his journey from the perspective of conversion and faith, he expresses the restlessness of his heart and a longing to, for a yet-to-be-attained satisfaction in the Lord. As Augustine revisits and ponders the sins of his youth, the moral and intellectual missteps that took him away from and then toward the Lord, he does so with a perpetual renewal of longing for a wholeness he does not yet possess. Indeed, the entirety of the Confessions is an exercise in pray praise and longing, a recollection of the privation privations that elicited his yearning and gently and gradually augmented the invitation of the Lord toward deeper and deeper union with him. For Augustine, all longing took the form of an orientation toward the divine, for to long is always to long for God. At the same time, such longing is infused with hope because it is longing that is initiated by God, for a wholeness that is promised by God. We long for God from within the promise of God. We have been assured of the rest that will sate our restlessness, and therefore, we are the restless who live toward the promise of, promise of rest. Wholeness or completeness sought by Augustine can bear the burden of this assurance because it is rooted in the beckons of a personal God. The form of the privation expressed in Catholic longing is that of a covenant. Our hearts are restless until, expresses the mode proper to Catholic longing. In a word, that mode is hope. Hope resembles longing in a romantic sense inasmuch as it is oriented towards some wholeness that it lacks. It is restless and deprived and yearns to be complete. But hope differs insofar as it is not defined by its lack, but by its assurance. Moreover, hope's assurance, grounded in divine promise, transcends boundaries and limitations, including the boundaries and limitations inherent in our rationality. To live in hope is to live fully in light of the divine promise, even or perhaps especially when the divine promise seems frustrated by limitation. Indeed, the fulfillment of hope necessitates the frustration of the most significant of limitations, namely death. In other words, hope orients us toward a completion or wholeness that we cannot understand or even imagine. It shatters the boundaries of plausibility and opens us to an existence we cannot fathom. Our audacity in hoping beyond every limitation arises from the fact that our hope has its source in divine promise, a divine promise that assures us a share in divine life itself. In embracing this promise of a share in the divine life, we also embrace a kind of liberation of the imagination from its ordinary sense of limitation, to which I will turn now. What I've tried to suggest so far is that the creativity of the Catholic imagination emerges from a specific kind of longing, a hope-filled longing, that differs from ordinary longing in that it is predicated on a promise of a share in the divine life. In a word, I have suggested that the Catholic imagination is an eschatological imagination. The divine promise of a share in the divine life points our longing toward the eschaton, transforming the way in which all limits and boundaries function within the Catholic imagination. At the same time, just as the eschatological destiny of the soul does not render all prior human events, including death, meaningless, so also the eschatological outlook of the Catholic imagination does not render all endings or limits meaningless. Indeed, the meaning of all prior events is heightened in light of the eschatological end because the end is present to all other events in the form of hope. The effect of hope on the Catholic imagination, therefore, is twofold. On one hand, hope relativizes the end or the limit. The Catholic imagination has been stretched by the reality of the promise of divine intimacy. In light of that superimaginative end, all other ends acquire an air of transience. On the other hand, hope affirms the ending or limit because it is precisely in the ending or limit that the need for hope is most fully recognized and expressed. Hope indicates both a disruption of the ordinary sense of limitation and a profound, a profound continuity between hope as it is lived in the form of longing and hope as it is lived in the form of fulfillment. Catholic imagination, I would suggest, always bears the mark of this complexity around the ending or limit of the work of art. Endings or limits are subject to revision, to superabundant possibilities, 
to saturation by unimagined and unimaginable meanings. Just as the apparent end of a human life unfolds into an eschatological destiny, so also the end or limit of the work of art is open to a frame beyond itself. At the same time, that very openness transforms the significance of the end. While maintaining its imminence, the end or limit fully transcends its earthly limitations. An eschatological orientation radically recontextualizes the end or limit, embedding it into infinity, into the story of salvation. Not merely a conduit for meaning, the experiential contact with the infinite, the end or limit, in a sense, baptizes the work with eschatological meaning, satisfying the accompanying longing and bringing it to completion. In so doing, it reaffirms the significance of the end because the end participates through hope in the eschatological. The eschatological raises the end by placing it in transformed continuity with possibilities it could, ima could not imagine on its own terms. The reflections I've offered so hard, far have been perhaps excessively abstract. That is in part a necessity of attempting to say something broad about the Catholic imagination. In the time that remains, adhering to the principle of non multa sed multum, I would like to offer a brief example of how hope transforms the end or the limit of a work of Catholic imagination, particularly familiar and dear to the Catholic imagination, Evelyn Waugh's Brides had revisited. Parenthetically, I observe that the case I've made is perhaps most easily supported in the case of the novel. It will be more difficult to make concrete claims about endings or limits in the case of, say, sculpture, though I have some confidence that the argument still holds. Wall offers perhaps the most well-defined example of the Catholic imagination's unique conception of the end or limit in the conclusion of Brideshead. The love affair between Charles Ryder and Julia Flight, which has become the novel's touchstone of real love, of redemption even, ends abruptly and painfully when Julia, still married to her first husband, Rex, refuses to elope with Charles and vows that she will not do the un unforgivable, the bad thing I was on the point of doing that I'm not quite bad enough to do, set up a rival good to God's. Charles, the ever intractable agnostic, whose reluctant integration into the patterns of the flight family's intense Catholic piety seemed to have only heightened his sense of spiritual alienation and left him brokenhearted, can only reply, I hope your heart may break, but I do understand. If Wah has successfully moved us to care for Julia and Charles, to believe in their love, then the conclusion of the final chapter is tragic. Catholicism has been the cause of untold pain, the disintegration of the only love we've been permitted to believe in. But Wah does not give this disintegration the final word. In the epilogue to Brideshead Revisited, we return to the present, to Charles, an officer in the British Army, as the Second, Second World War draws slowly to a close. He finds himself again at Brideshead, now overrun with military personnel, and again in the chapel there that first invited his curiosity and then his disgust. There he contemplates before the tabernacle, the dissolution of it all, Brideshead, the flights, his life, the world, and yet he thinks something unexpected has also come of it. Quote, Some, something quite remote from anything the builders intended has come out of their work and out of the fierce little human tragedy in which I played. Something none of us thought about at the time, a small red flame, a beaten copper lamp of deplorable design, relit before the beaten copper doors of a tabernacle. It could not have been lit but for the builders and the tragedians. And there I found it this morning, burning anew among the old stones. Charles Ryder's discovery, I would like to suggest, gives voice to the very authorial deference that Wall performs in destabilizing the conclusion of the novel with the addition of an epilogue. Something quite remote from anything the builders intended has come out of their work. The ending that the novel intended is revisited in the light of hope. Charles Ryder's fate is not sealed, nor his redemption guaranteed. You're not permitted to see the remainder of Charles' story play out. Instead, we are reminded that the end may not be the end that the limit we expected might be superseded by the unexpected, the unfathomed, the unimaginable. I've attempted to offer in this short paper the rudiments of a reflection on the significance of hope within the Catholic imagination. Hopefulness, as I have tried to show, has a close analog in longing in as much as it serves an orienting function with respect to wholeness or perfection. But hope, which is grounded in the promise of divine union, is also radically different from longing. When we hope, we do so with divine assurance. 
Moreover, the divine assurance in which we place our hope speaks of the disruption of limits and of ends. The result is that we hope beyond what we can long for. We hope for what we are not able to know or imagine. Nevertheless, even as ends and limits are relativized by the eschatological frame, they are also elevated by hope because hope establishes a continuity between that which is beyond our imagination and that which is here and now. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Emma, Mac Emma McDonald. She's currently a doctoral candidate in theological ethics at Boston College. Her areas of interest include sexual ethics, the conscience, and the role of narrative and ethics. She received her Master of Arts in Religion from Yale Divinity in 2019, where she studied ethics and literature. While at Yale, she also explored how short stories and poetry could contribute to moral discourse and imagination, especially in medical ethics. She also spent a semester interning at Commonweal and served as fiction editor for the Yale Institute of Sacred Music's Literary, Art, Liter Literary Arts Journal Letters. She received a BA from Middlebury College in Religious Studies in 2016. Please welcome Emma. I have a PowerPoint, so I'm going to talk from over here. Um, so I wanted to start with an image from Robert Lax's poem, The Circus of the Sun, which I'll be talking about. Um, in conjunction with Fanny Howe's novel, Indivisible. But I also wanted to show you this book that um, his poem is excerpted in because it was just republished in paperback form. And before that, it was kind of hard to find. And so I'm excited that it's now more accessible. So this is the very beginning of The Circus of the Sun. And he says, and in the beginning was love. Love made a sphere. All things grew within it. The sphere that encompassed beginnings and endings, beginning and end. Love had a compass whose whirling dance traced out a sphere of love in the void. In the center thereof rose a fountain. The opening lines of Lax's poem, The Circus of the Sun, reimagine creation as a whirling dance of love, encompassing void and overflowing presence. The spherical imagery he employs is but one example of the enduring image of the circle to convey the search for God. Long before Lax, the Greeks believed that the circle represented God in geometric form. Circular movement, or perichoresis, has neither beginning nor end, and thus expresses the eternity and coherence of the Trinity becoming what Simone Weil calls the geometrical image of divine mediation. This paper will explore how the concepts of bewilderment in Fanny Howe's novel Indivisible and Unfolded Grace in Lax's poem both trace this circular search for God. According to Fanny Howe, a paradigm image for the circular search for God can be found in the life of the monk. In Howe's novel, Indivisible, the main character, Henny, muses about the monotony of monastic life. While its repetitious days and prayers appear to yield no results, Henny insists, the seed of revelation is buried in the monastery, as is the salvation of the contemporary church. Henny likens the rhythms of monastic life to the cadence of a clock. Both illuminate the paradoxical nature of time and trace the winding path of human connection to the divine. The clock and the time it records appear frustratingly constant and contained. The hands never move beyond their prescribed notches, nor do they breach the circle they inscribe. And yet the hands move incessantly onward, marking the continuous advancement of time. The center of the clock appears a useless void, the clock's meaning to us lies in the relation of its hands to its numbers. Like the clock encircling its empty center, the monastery revolves around God, an absent presence or present absence that cannot be penetrated, only circumnavigated in a winding spiral. Henny concludes, I think the imitation of the clock is a useful practice for all humanity to learn from. 
Howe's novel Indivisible echoes the restless immobility of the clock in both form and image, trying to convey what she calls bewilderment. Howe describes bewilderment as a dream where one continu continually returns to pause on a gyre. She says, in both my stories and my poems, it could be the shape of the spiral that imprints itself in my interior before anything emerges on paper. Like the hands of the clock circling its center, bewilderment circumnavigates, believing that at the center of errant or circular movement is the empty but ultimate referent. In order to convey bewilderment, invisible, indivisible teeters between the necessity of a linear plot and the decidedly unlinear quality of human experience. Penny's constant revisiting of encounters in her life reflect not only her precarious state of bewilderment, but also illuminate the only way to resolve the unresolvable, to dwell in transit in the liminality of the innermost void of mystery. Henry Henny reflects, I am a crackle of static between God and God, motion without color. Who dares to ride between all things forever, like the chirp from a bird's beak before it finds an ear? I don't know who God is, Godding inside of me. The images of riding between all things forever, of crackling between God and God, communicates Henny's awareness of her own bewilderment. She is constantly uprooted and in flux. Indivisible constitutes her experiment with a more chaotic enactment of the search for God in everyday experience. The novel presents a jumbled sequence of events and reflections that displace the reader, at the same time, however, Indivisible ends in terms of plot and narrative exactly where it begins. To confront the impossibility of expressing in words the fact that actions occur simultaneously, Howe returns again and again to the same events in different ways. This structure generates a tautness, a sense of both movement and stagnation that stretches the boundaries of the novel so that, that its center becomes inscrutable. Indivisible itself echoes the hollow tick of the clock, circling the boundaries of a limitless void. The transience of bewilderment causes Henny to feel invisible. She says, the only thing I have in common with God is that I don't exist. While this moment of despair appears as a low point for Henny, it creates the opportunity, or as Simone Weil might put it, it creates the void, through which grace can enter. The destruction of Henny's false sense of self allows for what Vey calls the divine emptiness, fuller than fullness, to occupy her. Thus, Henny's bewilderment enables her to understand, at least briefly, her own worthiness by first forcing her to acknowledge the opposite. It is only once she is utterly lost and hopeless that she experiences grace. The insight granted by Grace allows Henny to tell this story and to facilitate for the reader a glimpse of the glimmers of Grace. As she puts it early on in Indivisible, there is a kind of story God that glides along under everything else that is happening. And this kind of story only jumps out into the light like a silver fish when it wants to see where it lives in relation to everything else. The ability to see oneself in relation to everything else like the fish that flashes out of the water, is a fleeting resolution to bewilderment. Those who experience grace after uprootedness see God's presence. A glimpse of God helps one ascend, transcending the misery of uprootedness, but also facilitates a return to rootedness, not in one's historical roots, but in love, in the divine order, the community of all creation. Robert Lax's poem, The Circus of the Sun, which recounts the wonders of the wandering Christiani family circus, offers the poet and the circus performer as joyful models of being rooted in love. Lax, a 20th century poet known particularly for his friendship with Thomas Merton, was constantly uprooting himself. As his biographer Michael McGregor tells it, in his later years, Lax joked that anytime anyone opened a car door, he got in. Lax's wanderings took him on tour through Western Canada with the Christiani family circus, after which he composed the long poem, The Circus of the Sun. The imagery of the circle is apparent from the very beginning. In the first section called Morning, he begins, 
Sometimes we go on a search and do not know what we are looking for until we come again to our beginning. Even in this first line, Lacks gestures towards what Howe conceives of as bewilderment. Like an indivisible, the circus of the sun is circular, not only in imagery, but in structure. The jubilance of the Christiani family illuminated in the poem is encased within the circadian rhythms of the circus, which are in turn embraced by creation as a whole. Creation becomes the outermost part of the spiral, but also forms its core. It is the very source of the circus's jubilance. Just as the hands of the clock trace their own circle while always gesturing to the clock frame and closing them, the acrobat's somersaults, the juggler's rings, and the ballooning orb of the circus tent all revel in cyclical creation, what Lax calls the circus of the sun. The lifestyle of the circus members is like clockwork. They rise in the morning and unfurl their tent, marking the rising circle of the sun. As dusk approaches, the tent deflates, the sun goes down, and the circus dies until it arrives in the next town, a joyous reenactment of a wandering death and resurrection. Lax's poetry functions similarly. Circus of the Sun simultaneously charts the freewheeling circus spectacles and the grander revolutions of all of creation, opening the reader up to the ever-widening circles that swell the span of God's eternal kingdom. And indeed, like the gesture of each Christiani stunt and each poem, the whole of Lax's life serves as a gesture, a tick of the clock that with its whole existence echoes the glory of God. Those who rose early enough to witness the building of the circus have seen, as Lax says, all the days of creation in one day. We have known the creation of the firmament and of the water and of the dry land and of the creatures that moved in the deep and of the creatures that moved on the land and of the creation of men, the waking of acrobats. We have known these things from the beginning of the morning for we woke early, we rose and came to the field. Thus, the morning of the circus is not mere entertainment. It praises God and capturing its observers in the enrapturing outpouring of creation, allows them to see beyond the present moment into the eternity of time as they witness both the origin and the continuity of God's creation. Witnessing creation in this way allows the circus performers to recognize their place in creation. For lax, the acrobats are God's chosen people. Mogador, a good friend to Lax and one of the primary performers appearing in the poem, captures the gracefulness of the acrobats as they move through the world. Of Mogador, Lax says, he walks the earth like a turning ball, knowing and rejoicing in his sense of balance. He delights in the fulcrums and levers, teeter boards, trampolines, high wires, swings, the nets, ropes, and ring curbs of the natural universe. Lax emphasizes the fact that Mogador sees all of creation as a delight, as a spectacle that can amaze. To Mogador, the world beyond the circus tent is itself a circus, carefully ordered and balanced, yet miraculous. Mogador exemplifies Fanny Howe's description of bewilderment. She says, for to the spiral walker, there is no plain path. No up and down, no inside or outside. Beneath his feet, the world is buoyant, thin and alive as a bounding rope. He stands on it poised, a gyroscope on the rim of a glass, sustained by the whirling of an inner wheel. He steps through the drum of light and air, his hand held forth. The moment is a sphere moving with Mogador. In these lines, the spherical imagery returns. The outer world is a sphere, a turning ball, a gyroscope, but Mogador's interior also contains an inner wheel. These lines recall the imagery of circles inscribed within circles from earlier stanzas in Lax's poem and in Howe's novel, Indivisible. Mogador provides the paradigmatic example of the circus performer rooted in love and the divine order. Howe asks, who dares to ride between all things forever? Lax answers, Mogador. Lax refers to the feats of the Christiani circus as unfolded grace. He sees the freedom of the artist and acrobat as participation in God's wisdom, as heavenly grace unfolding, flowering and reflecting in the physical grace of the player. 
He contrasts this freedom with the world of men condemned to earn their bread by the sweat of their brow, a clear reference to the Genesis story of Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden. Lax values the freedom of the wanderers in the earth, the monk, acrobat, and artist who live by playing, like the lilies of the field in the Gospel of Matthew. Playing, says Lax, forces us into the present moment. The circus life provides the same function. He asks, what do we know of the way of our walking? Only this step, this movement, gone as we name it. Abiding in the present requires a disavowal of the ego. For instance, in the Circus of the Sun, Mogador struggles to perform a somersault to impress Penelope, the tightrope walker. At first, he overthinks it. His internal voice says as he attempts it, I am a flame, I am a dark cloud, a bird. I will land like spring rain on a mountain lake for the delight of Penelope, the tightrope walker. And he fails. It is only when he forgets his motivations and pressures and relinquishes his attachment to success that he succeeds. Lax writes, he didn't think anything. He just did a somersault and landed with two feet on the horse's back. To emphasize the empty fullness of this moment, Lax adds, Mogador looked at her, then back at the horse, and with a gesture of two arms, he said, it was nothing. In this moment, Mogador is able to shed his ego and empty himself to allow the grace of God to enter. And this becomes evident in his accomplishment of the trick. Like Mogador, Lax found himself drawn towards emptiness and absence as his poetry matured. His work following the Circus of the Sun becomes sparse and simple. Like Henny at the end of Indivisible, he sees his role as one of transparency, of letting in the colorful light of the divine without getting in its way. Lax's journal entries collected in the book, Love Had a Compass, end with a spare prayer he composed, which I'll read to conclude. I praise the Lord for the beauty of the sun. Beauty of the sun. I praise the Lord for the sound of the wind. The sound of the wind. The sound of the wind. The beauty of the sun. The beauty of the sun. The sound of the wind. The sound of the wind. In another land, and with my own compasses. I will not look further for righteousness. I will understand you only in your absences. The constant repetition imbues this poem with a liturgical circularity. Unlike indivisible, however, it does not articulate agitation. Instead, it offers praise. Though Lax's later poems are subtler in their circular imagery, his time wandering with the circus gave him the courage to strive for his own pure act through poetry. Jack Kelly recounts that when Lax, Lax was asked in 2000 how long he had traveled with the Christiani family, he answered, even till now. Through praise of the vast wonders of God and creation, Lax gestures past the inadequacy of our language to God. Perhaps Simone Weil would find Lax's poems beautiful. She esteems poetry composed while the attention is kept directed towards inexpressible inspiration, insofar as it is inexpressible. The last lines of Lax's poem, free from punctuation, accept the limits of our capacities in the circular search for God. The compasses of Lax's poetry and his pilgrim life trace a spiral around the ineffable as Lax revels in the state of bewilderment. Whirling that is central to bewilderment is the natural way for the lyric poet, says Howe. The Circus of the, of the Sun suggests that this is also true of the circus performer and their poet. Thank you. And please welcome our third um, speaker today, Stephen Tardif. He is an assistant professor at the University of St. Michael's College in the University of Toronto, or Toronto, where he teaches in the Christianity and Culture program. He has been a fellow at the Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard University and a visiting scholar at the Academy of Arts and Sciences. His publications include articles and essays on Gerard Manley Hopkins, 
Thomas Hardy and James Joyce, and his current book project explores the connection between literary form and self-formation in Victorian England. He also serves as a co-editor of the Hopkins Quarterly. Please welcome Stephen Tardiff. I forgot to set up my PowerPoint talk, pardon me. Uh, this is the void where grace can allow to end. Well, I, I thought it was an example of uh, desire. Uh, so, and maybe that's going to be the, the theme of this talk. Uh, or we might all just imagine it. All right. Well. I'm going to actually use that as a segue to just uh, launch into my talk without uh, the images. But uh, you, uh, I mean, unless someone can maybe come up and, and uh, the center column right here. No, that's not mine, unfortunately. I mean, it, to ver we could check it out. <laughs> yeah, I do have I do have the stick, and I plugged it in, but it's not making the magic happen. Hello? Thank you. I mean, we need the pictures, right? I, you know, one thanks. One thanks, but all right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. I begin with this well-known quotation attributed to St. Francis because it encapsulates the two themes of my talk. On the one hand, the quotation brings into view the role of words, actions, and images in the transmission of the gospel message. On the other hand, it raises questions about the idea of transmission itself. Because despite the fame of this quotation and the way that it points to the radical gesture at the root of the Franciscan way of life, St. Francis never uttered those words. In 2006, one of St. Francis's biographers, Mark Golley, argued that the popularity of this apocryphal quotation reveals more about us than it does about the saint himself, since it, quote, goes hand in hand with a postmodern assumption that words are finally empty of meaning. But in the decade since Golley offered that judgment, we might well question whether this quotation says as much, as much about us as it once did. Not because words now have more meaning, but because images have less. In recent years, images have become as corroded and compromised as language itself, a visual culture dominated by supersaturation, simulation, and irony has eroded their power and meaning. Deep fakes and dank memes to take just two recent but representative phenomena, have taught us how not to read images, how not to take them seriously, and they now evoke the same suspicion that characterizes postmodernist theories of language. This crisis of the image and all of the consequences that it implies for the transmission of traditions is the context in which I'm going to locate Paolo Sorrentino's 2016 series, The Young Pope. This critically acclaimed show tells the story of one Lenny Bellardo, pictured here, uh, who on assuming the Petrine office proves to be a riddle wrapped in an enigma wearing a triple tiara, a young American who revives the oldest traditions of the papacy, a phonogenic figurehead who nevertheless manages to remain completely invisible to the public, refusing photographs and visual representations of all kinds. Not only do the show's obvious contradictions drive its unfolding drama, but they are also the means by which it explores the contemporary status of images and their enduring power. In fact, Sorrentino orchestrates a striking contrast between his titular character's media strategy and the lavish visual style of the series precisely in order to present his viewer with the paradox of an untransmitted image. What you see is what his fictional faithful don't get. Thus does the Vatican's reservoir of hidden, 
uncommunicated beauty become a kind of stand-in for the untransmitted artistic and religious traditions that are inaccessible in a world where the only modes of visual mediation are parody and profusion. Now, this is not to say that the show holds itself aloof from these postmodern modes. On the contrary, it features many instances where the audience's expectations of papal parody, an expectation elicited by the show's very title, are fulfilled. At one extreme, we have images like this one that seem purely parodic, images where the eponymous young pope in black shades appears for purposes which are only obliquely related to the show's plot. Or take the moment when Michelangelo's Pieta, after being featured itself early on in the series, is recreated with Lenny and another character. Such irreverent juxtapositions find a kind of apex in the show's opening sequence, which is comprised of a series of similar travesties. Here, a blazing meteor passes through the backgrounds of famous works of art that feature pivotal scenes in the history of Christianity. As Lenny walks past them in the foreground with an instrumental version of All Along the Watchtower playing. The clear implication here is that the devastating effect of Lenny's papacy is materialized in the metaphor of the meteor, as he too wreaks havoc on the tradition of which he is now part. Such a reading is what this and the show's other parodic images would seem to confirm. Indeed, the particular kind of chaos that a modern audience expects a young pope is depicted in one of the dream sequences that opened the show's first episode. Here, the newly elected Lenny dreams of announcing from the balcony of St. Peter's an about face on a host of moral issues from masturbation to abortion. But of course, while Lenny is an agent of disruption, his is a very different brand of chaos. He throws the church into turmoil by his radical return to traditions and not by his interruption of them. The show thus turns the audience's expectations of what a young pope would do into the first interpretive hurdle that it clears, opening, opening a fresh space in which to encounter Lenny's contradictions cleansed of predictable preconceptions. The reorientation that the show's opening scene prompts is also, I think, the key to reading its apparent images of outright parody. Instead of really subverting traditions through travesty or irreverence, these images are actually the vehicles for communicating tradition. It's no accident, for instance, that the comic montage of a disrobed pope dressing himself to the theme of I'm sexy and I know it precedes one of the show's most stunning and technically accurate tableau. Pictured here, that of Lenny entering the Sistine Chapel on a sedan chair in the full regalia of an ancient pontiff, papal tiara and all. As such, the spectacular juxtapositions of the ultra-modern with the ultra-traditional, which the show never tires of displaying, ought to be read through the lens of the gospel parable about the Lord of the house, bringing from his storeroom both the old and the new. In other words, the young pope incorporates the language of contemporary visual culture precisely in order to create a meeting point between the early 21st century and the ethos of earlier ages. Nor is our own historical moment with its specific moods and media climate, the only one with which the series goes out of its way to evoke. There is, for instance, the age of Aquarius of Lenny's parents who abandon him at an orphanage, a scene to which we return throughout the series with intermittent flashbacks. But there are also evocations of the world before free love, flower children, and the Second Vatican Council. Pope Pius XIII's name is obvious enough, but the subtle visual cue of his constant smoking and even the old-timey name of Lenny itself are deliberate, anachronistic details threaded through the fabric of the show that evoke this vanished world even more concretely than its actual flashbacks. Both of these modes of reference serve the same end of an attenuating an asymmetry to which Lenny objects in the first episode. Commenting on his clear preference for older forms and norms, he remarks that, quote, the past is wide, whereas, quote, the present has only room for one pair of eyes. In addition to articulating Lenny's own attitude, his suggestive phrase also points out the problem that an artist like Sorrentino faces in working in television or film, where there really is only room for one pair of eyes at a time. Creator and character, then, face parallel dilemmas. Lenny's project, on the level of the show's plot, 
resembles the one with which Sorrentino grapples on the level of the show's conceit. How to use images in order to create room in the eyes of the fictional faithful and in the eyes of the audience as well. Although we've already examined some of Sorrentino's techniques for doing just this, Lenny's striking media strategy is by far the most important. As we watch him disappear behind the walls of the Vatican, concealing himself as he reminds us, like Hubrick, Salinger, Daft Punk, and Banksy, the audience sees one of the most common techniques that cinema and television use to create imagistic desire laid bare. From horror movies to whodunits, MacGuffins are the very substance of suspense, and the absence of pivotal, plot-structuring persons or objects creates the eschatological, future-directed, forward-moving arcs which are a staple of cinematic form. But in confronting this conceit so explicitly in Lenny's strategic abstention from the faithful's view, Sorrentino was able, as it were, to have his pope and hide him. That is to say, he can, on the one hand, indulge a sumptuous visual style that re revels in surfaces without any fear of triumphalist nostalgia, because each new view reminds the audience of Lenny's questionable actions and troubling ambitions. At the same time, the show's inescapable, ubiquitous beauty exposes what is often just a cheap technique. Sorrentino's images, in other words, are purged of any artificially induced interest and hold our attention by virtue of their own power. Indeed, throughout the series, the audience learns to mistrust the most common sources of revelation that television and cinema employ. There are no lurid secrets to learn about Lenny, and when characters in the show seek, for instance, to reveal the contents of a secret stash of letters, these turn out to be completely devoid of damaging or compromising details. Instead, the show merely delivers the most obvious theories to the audience in a way which is so direct that the explanatory power of such revelations is ultimately undermined. The fact of Lenny's orphanhood, for example, is such a conspicuous source for his motives that its force is actually undercut by its all too obvious explanatory power. Thus, by immediately delivering supposedly subversive secrets and dramatizing the very act of concealment, one of television's signature plot driving techniques is disrupted and exposed. In the same way that parody becomes a vehicle through which to expand the show's historical imaginary, the simulation of absence is turned into a tool for thinking about the structure of the stories that can be told through the medium which Sorrentino employs. Of course, the delicious irony here is that the subversive exposure of this signature trope occurs within the very form which seems to have done so much to fracture the integrity of the image through the use of similar techniques. A quarter century ago, David Foster Wallace concluded his seminal essay on television by noting what kind of desire emerges in the imaginative cul-de-sac that TV has created, a dead end where detached irony or artificial interest are the only possible modes. Wallace writes, quote, the postmodern founder's patricidal work was great, but patricide produces orphans, and no amount of revelry can make up for the fact that writers my age have been literary orphans throughout our formative years. We're kind of wishing some parents would come back. The orphanhood of Lenny Bellardo is clearly, at some level, the embodiment of precisely this kind of abandonment. But the larger point here is that a new form of television is the very means through which this intergenerational trauma is being explored. Sorrentino has called TV, the TV being produced by platforms like HBO and Netflix, quote, the handsome child of literature and film. The Young Pope, then, as an example of, quote, cinema on the scale of the novel, represents a difference not just in degree, but in kind. Streaming has spawned a new form, which constitutes both a continuation and a, de a development of the traditions of literature, film, and television. Like his character Lenny, Sorrentino shows what new possibilities are latent in tradition whose meaning and powers only seem to be finished and well-defined. But in exploring at the blended edge of television and cinema, the limits of these forms, Sorrentino also probes the limits of images themselves. And he does so by means of the same artistic traditions which the larger canvas of streaming makes available. The show gives us a, a symbol of Lenny's childhood trauma 
in the talismanic bowl of his absconded father's tobacco pipe, a conspicuously fragmented heirloom that clearly desires completion. But when this object is completed and apparently rejoined with its absent piece, the tableau which this totem forms is that of René Magritte's treachery of images. The point that Sorrentino drives home here with his clear allusion to this famous painting is that images can be the means of corroborating the illusions that we desire. This point, though, is one that depends on the artistic tradition with which the illusion connects and which this very connection extends. In other words, we learn in The Young Pope to distrust images by means of them. It's a lesson we are taught through a famous painting. And surprisingly, this lesson doesn't leave the viewer in a double bind. Instead of opening a typical postmodern aporia, the exposure of the limits of images points to a world beyond images, and to another sense, which remains inaccessible even on the new scale of novelistic cinema. In two pivotal scenes later in the series, frauds are exposed not through the discovery of documents, but through the sense of smell. Lenny's infallible nose detects a pair of imposters posing as his parents, and he makes the connection between moral corruption and physical stench in the presence of a soon-to-be-punished church figure with the withering line, quote, halitosis is a deformation of the soul. The sense of smell thus points beyond the image, an orientation confirmed by the canonization plot that coincides with the show's conclusion, or until October when the new season comes out. One of the last acts that Lenny performs is the elevation of a South American saint named Juana. While the focus on this fictional, composite saint is an index through which one can trace Lenny's growth as a character in various ways, Juana plays another role in the show's meditation on images. Lenny's handsome, statuesque face is the one that the world doesn't see. But Juana's face is one that, for the most part, we don't see. In flashbacks of her life, She's typically shot from the back, as if to indicate that her confirmed holiness is the very thing that the show can't show. Thus, the desire for images that the series renders so clearly on the level of plot finds its analog in the depiction of sanctity. The thing that occupies the place of the MacGuffin within the series, the thing that the form of the show induces our desire to see, isn't something we would immediately recognize or esteem. Just as heroic virtue can only be confirmed in retrospect, so too in the series, holiness itself is impossible to present directly. This then is the ultimate horizon onto which the young Pope opens, the paradox of sanctity. And rather than totally surpassing the image, this paradox actually returns us to it. For the invisibility of sanctity recasts the field of the visible as the arena of its possible appearance. Thus, while Lenny seems like a flawed and transparent mischief maker, a figure of titanic pride and limitless presumption, the show leaves open the possibility of which Sister Mary, his surrogate mother, is convinced that he is, in fact, a saint. Although so many scenes in this series dazzle the audience's gratified eye, the images which remain even more transfixing than those of Sorrentino's recreated Vatican are ones of Lenny in prayer. The scenes themselves are often prefaced by off-putting, preemptory invocations. The formula is some version of, Lord, we must now speak about, etc. But interestingly, Lenny's tone never seems to impede the efficacy of his petitions. Indeed, these bold overtures only make the question more pressing. Is Lenny really talking to God in these moments? Does God, as he always seems to, really answer his prayers? These undecidable questions hover over Lenny when he kneels before a convoy of stock trucks, or at the bottom of a pool when he prays for the repose of his best friend's soul. As such, these images form a kind of meeting point of the visible and the invisible, the beauty in which the show revels on the one hand, and the sanctity which can only be a speculation on the other. These images, therefore, give and withhold. They play outside the economy of plot and beyond any obvious artistic tradition. But for this very reason, they demonstrate how and where novelty enters both the traditions of art and the traditions of the church, unexpectedly, and through the narrow gate of the present moment. At one point in the series, Lenny reminds an interlocutor that he's an orphan, and orphans, quote, are never young. 
But paternity, as James Joyce reminds us, is a mystical state. And while parents are given, precursors are elected. We are witnessing the cinematic products of streaming TV elect their own precursors. And as we do, we see a new set of aesthetic norms emerge. These norms open up within our contemporary visual culture, a place where the limits of older forms can be explored and longer traditions can be created. The yet to be realized possibilities of streaming will be the achievement of a new tradition. And as it develops, artists and evangelists alike might well turn to Sorrentino's work as an example, a vivid demonstration of the possibilities that images possess beyond the modes of late 20th century television. A young pope, after all, is a kind of emblem of the radical potential of all traditions. Indeed, such a pope points towards the God who is, as St. Augustine says, younger than us all. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, glad to have seen the images. It would have been really funny not to have seen them. I trust all your imaginations greatly. <laughs> Um, I'd love to have our speakers entertain at least a couple questions, knowing that we are already in overtime. That's okay. Uh, not because of you, but because of our Kairos timing. Um, questions for our speakers? Uh, yeah, and, and maybe my answer is going to open it up to, to Julie and Emma and the, and the way that they can respond in their own sort of uh, investigations, which focus really on the novel and, and poetry um, in various ways. And, and I would sort of begin by uh, locating my answer there, because there is a, a sense in which, you know, what Sorrentino is so, um, I think, fired by is this ability to really produce a 10 hour movie. You know, that's, that's really something that uh, for, a, for a director of feature films is something that is so suggestive and so new and so powerful. Um, and, his, and his telling connection with novelistic form is one which I think is the through line because that's maybe the place where he can push beyond some of the expected tropes. Um, you know, the, the, the figural excess of an epilogue of a novel like Brideshead, you know, the, the way in which it's sort of, you know, surpassing its own limits when commenting on its own actions. That's, I think, what Sorrentino's finding and exploring. This is a way to, yes, there are ironic moments, but it's, it's also the means by which he can sort of um, explore a whole encyclopedia of different visual moods, as it were, different tonalities. And I think that is sort of like part of this answer. And it all, ultimately, I think, goes to, uh, the historical moment in a certain kind of way, in the same way that romanticism was sort of like, you know, a, a very sort of like felt presence for articulating a certain kind of desire. And just in the same way that uh, our contemporary moment for the poets that you mentioned um, is also sort of like deeply implicated in the forms that they use. I think that is part of where we can see some of these dynamics playing out.
Um, I guess to speak to that as well, what what I actually thought of when you were giving your presentation, which I really enjoyed having just watched The Young Pope recently, was um, David Lynch. I don't know if that's uh, if you're familiar with his work at all, but I think when you were talking about precursors and sort of like the transition to a more streaming version of media, I thought about him in part because his films have had so much influence on um, filmmaking today, but, and he's still, you know, at work, obviously. But also because um, when Twin Peaks came out in the early '90s, it, I think, was his version of having like a, you know, 10, 20 hour movie where it, it just unfolded in this very mysterious and slow, but accessible way. Um, but it also was very much before its time and anticipated. I think a lot of the like transitions that. You so that was unrelated to, to Robert Lacks, but I, that's just what I thought of. I mean, that's such a great connection to make because Twin Peaks in this very strange kind of way exists before and after the sort of like reign of irony in a way. And and, and Agent Cooper is like the most sincere person on the planet. He's like uh, a, the Dudley Do-Right of the American imaginary in this kind of way. And he is sort of like just immune and inured to all the kinds of tropes of, I, like there's no Seinfeld or Letterman, I'm outside the sketch thing with Twin Peaks. And the very fact that he sort of like just wakes up from this coma in this peculiar kind of aphasia is almost Lynch's metaphor for, you know, returning to this very sincere mode, I think. Uh, you know, and but, but uh, you know, as the connections with the long form miniseries of Brideshead and, and Lynch's work, I think like the, the point here is one about scale. Uh, and, it, and I think maybe puts us onto the track of the way that uh, thinkers like Balthazar want to think about what the grandest scale possible might mean for Christian revelation. Also, one thing, one sort of similarity I see between uh, definitely Dale Cooper and Twin Peaks and, and David Lynch and Robert Lacks, um, and perhaps also in The Young Pope is like this sense of childlikeness that comes with a simplicity, but also um, and a sense of like lightheartedness and delight, but it's also very serious at the same time. And I think there, there's less of that in Fanny Howe's work at times because there's more of sort of like this deep um, misery. And Robert Lax doesn't really have a whole lot of that. He, I, I think his work tends to be much more um, focused on joy and praise than interrogating the depths of darkness. Um, but at the same time, I think he's able to communicate something that's very unironic. But at the same time, if you read his letters to Thomas Merton, they are total jokesters all the time. And they were both writing for Columbia's um, uh, magazine, The Jester, when they were there together. And so I think they definitely are um, sort of formed in a culture that involves a lot of um, of irony and satire. But, but uh, he also doesn't necessarily employ that in his poetry in the same way that uh, categories of his life. I would only add, um, I think one of the questions that my paper doesn't doesn't deal with, but that I think is deeply relevant, um, is what uh, the question of what hope will look like uh, in various kind of aesthetic iterations. Um, that uh, at a minimum, I've, I've tried to they, I've tried to frame it in sort of a, a minimalist way that it's it's an assurance of something, but what that assurance actually looks like um, and how something like ironic distance reshapes that assurance aesthetically, I think uh, is open to discussion. Um, um, well, I, so the systematic theologian in me uh, goes to, well, the cross is the condition, possibility of, eschatological union and um, uh, maybe in a more aesthetic register, the cross is um, our excellence of longing, um, of the dramatic tension that's that the appearance of an end that um, cannot imagine, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, that cannot imagine an end beyond itself. And yet, um, obviously, cross uh, and resurrection, you know, the, the possibility of resurrection um, emerges, and uh, so that becomes sort of, I suppose, the icon par excellence of what longing, how this kind of relation between 
belonging, um, and eschatology works itself out. But. And just almost to tack on with a connection to all the semen ve that you brought up, that, that is almost in a certain way the conditions under which ve wants to think about what hope is, like a hope without hope is a kind of ultimate figure for that. And, and maybe that somehow refracts and ramifies with you know, theological reflections on the cross and, and you know, the, the moment of despair, which also looks past death. I want to start a fight. I don't know uh, if this is going to do it because um, we, we also have to wind up. But it, it does occur to me as I'm listening to each of your papers and, and, and more broadly the conversations from today that I feel a little bit of a tension or contradiction or um, some kind of energy between, you know, what Andrew called the apophatic or maybe sort of the refusal of the world and worldly kind of things or, or the otherworldliness um, aspect of uh, Catholicism and then the this worldliness on the other side, the sort of the embrace of creation. Um, and, uh, and these two things, like, uh, I don't know, to me, it, the, the energy but, um, that each offers is different and you know i think about the, the the pageantry of the young pope and how you know a part of me is just is repelled utterly by that um and yet at the same time i i you know i love the the the, the sensory experience of you know certain traditions like uh, andrew's tradition the the sort of St. John Chrysostom, right, and the, the, the sort of Eastern Catholic, right? Any, in any case, do you, do you guys have any trouble with this, this question about the this worldly versus the other worldly as you're sort of thinking through these questions about what is precisely or are there multiple Catholic imaginations? Uh, I, I mean, I, I would say I, per, I, I personally have a more cataphatic, like, sort of. Uh, but uh, the short answer is, I think, yes, there are multiple Catholic imaginations. And um, even something like uh, the question I'm trying to address in this paper has a, a great deal of flexibility, which is sort of what I was, I was trying to get at in my response um, a few seconds ago, uh, just insofar as um, the content of hope uh, of what is hoped for beyond just an assurance um, could be more lean, more apophatic or cataphatic. It could lean more in the direction of, um, you know, an, uh, on one side the Catholic imagination could insist upon a, a more um, illuminative or illuminated or uh, imagistic approach to this is the content of hope. You know, um, on the other hand, uh, it could lean more in the, uh, a more apophatic direction that, that, that encounters. And I think in a postmodern context, that's, that's, it's the more viable option um, that we're encountering the limits of images constantly. And it's only in questioning and uh, distancing ourselves from them that we create a space for the divine. Um, so I think your attempt to bring us to fisticuffs is just going to bring us into a, a group hug of kumbaya because it's going to be this big Catholic both and moment, right? So, you know, the, the more, I mean, just to, to again, to confine, uh, just for the sake of the example, um, my answer just to the young pope, I think it really is governed by this uh, creation of attention. Like, it's not collapsing into one or the other. Yes, you have Lenny sort of like abstention, you really feel that in the way in which it sort of like pointed to at various moments where, you know, we want to see this figure. Like it, it, it's kind of like connecting with that great horror movie trope of like a, a blind person fighting a sighted person in this way. Like we see Lenny, but we know that he is absent. And, and precisely this simultaneity of feast and fasting that the show's style really gives you is sort of like one of these just axiomatic paradigmatic tensions of Catholicism and I think that's why the show is so popular with people who you know have commitments in the church and people without it really is kind of like a perfect example of what a Catholic imagination actually looks like uh, in, in a kind of way so I, I take your point that there is a tension but you know what I find most striking is that the tension doesn't break the system it actually makes it work Yeah, I would say um, I definitely see that tension in Robert Lax in particular, but I think um, similar to the, I would say they, they kind of like, 
work together in a way that's very productive for his faith, definitely. And I think he definitely progressed from being more cataphatic to apophatic. As uh, In terms of his poetry, he went from the Circus of the Sun style to this sort of like lyrical, like psalm-like style to being um, very concrete um, and sparse and just uh, focused on this sort of vertical mode, which I think uh, both are, are really resonate with me. And, and I don't see them in contradiction at all, but definitely in tension. And I think, um, but I do think they definitely represent a kind of both and, and that it ends up being very fruitful, which is part of the reason why I really like this image of the clock that has both the sense of presence and absence, because I think it does kind of capture uh, the importance of liturgy in the circular captured in, in his work. Uh, please thank our panelists for their great <laughs> papers.